All right, well, it's December, but it's still autumn. And so because of that, I thought, you know, let's talk about seasonality, um, the changes of the seasons, and what we can learn by looking at the vegetation and the animals. Also, we're all along a creek. And so you get different lifestyles, and that's one of the themes I want to talk about today is uh, the evolution of life history strategies. Meaning, what's the timing for organisms? Do they grow quickly? Do they grow slowly? Do they reproduce all of a sudden? Do they live a long time? So ecologists and evolutionary biologists have been really interested in that pattern of life. And when you're along a creek, you really get that sense that there's a pattern, especially in California, where we have a long period of drought, and then all of a sudden there's this richness of water. Um, and so as we go through along the creek, we're going to look at especially the trees, but also some of the birds that live here and talk about that idea of seasonality and life history. All right, so in the autumn, you'll see flocks of birds coming together. We're going to hope we're going to find some of those where you have chickadees and the titmouse and wrens and all sorts of uh, birds together, foraging together, bush tits, and they're all talking to each other. And you wonder, what are they feeding on? So in the autumn, this is what birds need to do. They need to spend the time in the autumn and the winter um, getting energy, getting food. Uh, and to see these mixed flocks, you know that's what they're doing. So if you, you'll find when you walk around the live oak trees, you're going to have no sound at all for a long time. And then all of a sudden, there'll be a tree just full of birds. And so together, they're looking for these little creatures that you don't even think, I mean, what are they eating? It doesn't look like there's anything here. So I, what I'm going to do is tap the vegetation and see if we can get the little invertebrates to fall out and get an idea of what they're eating. Okay, here we go. Oh, look at the size of that one. Well, there's a beetle, a you know, bug. Oh, wow. Okay, but let's get... Aren't you cute? Um, what's interesting about that one is that the red and the black coloration lets you know that it's toxic. So the birds are probably not going to eat that one. <laughs> which is interesting. It's a yellow and green and black one. Yeah, that one might not taste too good either, but um, I bet that one tastes better than the Cucumber other one. beetle. And you see this tiny little beetle? There? That's a caddis fly, I think. Let me... Um, Alright, so there's a spider. But Can you get this corner right here? I do think that's a caddis fly. And it's tiny! So its larva probably, you know, emerges within one year as an adult. You see this little guy? Look how inconspicuous that is. It's like the world of tiny things. Yummy for a chickadee. Yummy for a chickadee. Um, you know, entomologists have a secret. The world's amazing. <laughs> They call it life on a little known planet because, and then when my students get these tiny things under the microscope, it just changes their, their world view. I mean, look at the size of this baby. <laughs> That's pretty good size for a tree. And then you think about the other seeds that you've seen. Um, and the other plants, like grasses, you have, you know, wind-blown seeds and they make just thousands and thousands. And here you have this baby that's all ready to start life. Um, and we're going to talk about the attributes of dispersal, how this tree gets this baby into the, to the next place where it can grow, and um, the whole idea of life history. So investing in your growth, here's a, long, a plant that lives a long time. And it can live hundreds of years, let's say. We're going to look at some other trees here that have taken a completely different strategy for handling the drought. This one has leaves that last, you know, a couple years, and they always are green, so they're called live oak. Um, you'll see that they do drop, like two-year-old leaves. You know, so you think of autumn, and you think trees dropping their leaves. These do drop their leaves. And then we're going to see some trees along the creek that have that standard leaf out, live all summer, be happy about it, and then they drop their leaves. We have one here that drops its leaves during the summer, so it's like all this variation of 
how you can live in the same place and make a living and reproducing and getting your offspring to the next generation with different strategies. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, also over here, can you see the uh, Toyon down near the creek? That has those beautiful berries um, and those things remind everybody, the acorns and the berries, the animals are involved in the relationship here of helping to disperse the seeds of these plants. So that one, the Toyon, also called Christmas berry, which is a great thing to talk about at Christmas time. Um, they have beautiful red fruits and so they're communicating with the, with the birds that these seeds are ready to go. Same with the acorn. Um, and I asked you, I can hear a uh, scrub jay. Is that a Stellar's Day? Yeah. We saw one when we first got here burying one of these. And so that's the typical animals take the, the plant, they take the fruit, they poop out the seed or they actually bury it. And then you get this wonderful seed dispersal as part of their life history for these plants to depend on animals. So we're going to be looking at that. He's burying an acorn. Now the thing is, they have incredible memories for where they put stuff, right? But they bury way more than they can use. And so that's the strategy that the trees are taking advantage of is... Uh, it's, what's interesting is to have the scrub jays and the stellar jays both here. It's like they have slightly different requirements for, ha for habitat. So the range of the stellar jay is gonna go way up into the redwood forest. Um, and the scrub jay down more scrub habitat. But here they're like overlapping and it could be because of this creek. You know, that you have the Stellar's Jay and the Scrub Jay. What's interesting about those birds, Scrub Jays, some of the Scrub Jays, of course, you know, he was burying that acorn right in front of you. Um, if he doesn't trust us, he might come back and move it later. <laughs> it's like, he saw, we were watching him. <laughs> There's some fantastic experiments that have shown that some of the Jays, when they bury things, they remember where they put it. And if another Jay or, you know, if another Jay was watching him, he'll remember that and come back and move that acorn because he doesn't want any thief taking it. They're very sensitive and long-term memory. One of the things that we're seeing just standing here it was a Stellar's Jay, a Scrub Jay, and an Acorn Woodpecker. And all those birds are taking advantage of the bounty from these oak trees, which are the acorns. Um, and so the Acorn Woodpecker is a cooperatively breeding bird. They live in these big family groups and maybe only one female gets to lay the eggs and everybody else helps. And they store the acorns. They, make, they drill holes and store the acorns as a larder up in the trees. Um, so, and also the scrub jay and the stellar's jay are going to be storing the acorns and remembering where they put them. So you get this continuum, right? It's not just mutualism between the trees and the animals. The animals are predators on these seeds. But the plant takes advantage of the fact that many of these acorns are going to be left, dispersed away from the adult tree and given a chance to grow because the birds don't remember where everything is. The acorn woodpeckers probably drop a few, right? But it is a type of predation, which makes it very interesting. Um, Native Americans relied on these acorns. They're really bountiful. There are a number of species of oaks here that produce different kinds of acorns. And so, you know, that's, that's the thing that the plant is having to deal with is produce enough, invest in these offspring, know that some are gonna be sacrificed because the animals are the ones that are helping to disperse them. So this is, this is typical seasonality for autumn. And so we all think about the leaves falling. You see the beautiful sycamores, they turn color. Um, you know, it's just a celebration of the change in season. So this is a typical yay. <laughs> and we even call it fall, right? <laughs> for leaves falling. So many of the trees will have this, you know, gorgeous big leaves when they live along a creek they can do that there's plenty of water and they can have big leaves for photosynthesis they don't have to worry about desiccation and what's interesting and we're gonna we started with the oaks right the minute you get away from the creek the trees are going to be suffering from the drought of California but next to the creek the riparian habitat you can have leaves like this really exuberant leaves 
and they do drop them. This is one of the life history strategies that I mentioned is to have big, you know, solar collectors. They don't have to worry about the stress of drought um, and they spend the summer photosynthesizing and then they drop their leaves in autumn. So we also have big leaf maple. I don't know, we want to scan over here. That one, it still hasn't turned color yet, but that's a maple. And when you get a maple with leaves that size, you also know you're in the riparian habitat. They have their, their feet in the water and they can produce these gorgeous big leaves. Uh, so that's one of the things we're talking about is that life history strategy, how you time you know, growth and reproduction and being near the creek, you just get this typical, uh, what everybody thinks of what a tree can do, right? Big leaves, solar collectors, grow in the summer when you have lots of sunshine and then drop your leaves in the winter. And look at this one. What do you think about that one? <laughs> so these are grasses. Grasses have a completely different strategy for life. They have um, tiny seeds and then they have flowers that have the pollen that floats in the air and then windborne seeds. So a very, very different strategy of life. And it looks like they're producing their seeds now which is really fun, and they produce thousands and thousands of seeds. So remember I was talking about how the oak, the, the oak tree produces a few. Very high quality, young, they invest tremendously in each one. And um, as we go through, I'm gonna show you a plant that just goes all out to making the, the best start for their offspring. They make these huge seeds. And so we get that different kind of strategy just by walking around along the creek. This nest box uh, demonstrates something that happens with these cavity nesters and dwellers is that there's competition. And so this is the epitome of competition. Here you see the nest hole. You can see it's completely plugged and filled. This is a non-native species. This is the European honeybee has taken over this nest box that would have been meant for the wood ducks. But there's gonna be competition from from native species as well, um, you'll have small mammals trying to nest in there, other species of birds nesting in there. So when they put out these nest boxes to help, re help, help the wood duck population recover, there's going to be competition as well as predation. You'll have rats going in and attacking. This is like the epitome though, right? <laughs> Look at that. So the honeybees have taken that hole and honeybees do nest in holes and they found it and took it. So to try for, for those folks that are trying to restore habitat and manage species, they, they have to deal with the fact that there's gonna be competition when they put these nest boxes out for the wood duck. So this is pretty cool. So we want to talk a little bit about the wood ducks that uh, are doing really well here in this restoration project. This is one of the nest boxes and they attribute this to the Girl Scouts of Northern California. So obviously different groups have been involved in putting out these nest boxes. So a nest box represents a nest cavity. So normally the wood ducks and other ducks turns out um, as well as many species of birds do nest in cavities that are natural cavities, so they can't make their own hole in a tree. Can you imagine a duck trying to make a hole in a tree? Um, so they find the holes that naturally occur on trees, especially old growth trees. And one of the reasons wood ducks were having trouble over the number of decades is because they were hunted, but also they've lost habitat. So the loss of those big old trees that have the holes in it, that was a big problem. And so across the entire country, people have been putting up nest boxes and there have been what 18 nest boxes put along this creek here and the, the ducks were very successful this past year in reproducing and using these nest boxes. There's competition for the nest boxes because other creatures are gonna wanna use them, but the wood ducks, this beautiful bird, is doing much better across the entire country and into Canada, I believe, because of um, 
management. So in a lot of cases in conservation, we have people having to manage the recovery of species like the wood duck, which was almost extinct. So I'm going to talk a little bit about their life history. One of the things that, one of the words people use to describe them is philopatric. Philo or phil means to love, and patrick means country or place, so you think patriotism, the root of that word. So philopatric means they have a love for place. That means that when a bird is raised here, she's gonna, re she's gonna reproduce here. And so you get this local population building up. They have a love of the place where, they're, where they were born and where they were hatched and where they survived. And so, you know, if you tag the wood ducks here, you're gonna find that the population starts to build up and they come back and they, they keep breeding. They also find that an experienced female, she had a nest in one of these boxes um, the older she gets, the better she does as a mom, and she can produce many more offspring. They, they nest earlier, her babies survive better, and so that's what's happening with this population here, I believe, because they're doing better. Um, so another thing is that there are threats in these holes, and one of the threats, which is quite surprising, is that wood ducks will dump their eggs in other wood ducks' nests. So they're called brood parasites. It's called egg dumping. So they'll take advantage of it. So let's say there's a female that has a nest and other females watching her, and she will be like, oh, you can take care of my kids. She'll go in and put her eggs in someone else's nest. And that's called brood parasitism. And I think that's might be surprising to, to hear that a duck does that. She'll also put in different parts of the country, wood ducks will put their eggs in mergansers' nests. They also nest in cavities. Um, and I think you might also find it surprising that ducks nest up in trees. So that might be something you've never heard of before either. All right, so let's imagine here she is sitting on her nest in a box or in a tree hole. What happens when the eggs hatch? So out comes a little duckling and they sort of dry off for about and they get all fluffy in about a day. And they pretty much have the synchronous egg hatch, so they're all ready to go at the same time. They, they jump straight out of, the net, out of the hole and down to the ground, bounce along. Mommy goes in the water and off they go, paddling away uh, for their first day of life. They're all ready to go and they, they, learn, they learn how to eat all on their own. They're eating, um, they eat acorns, it turns out. They'll come up and they'll eat fruits and seeds and grain. But in the water, they're, they are these dabbling ducks. They go under the water and they get the invertebrates and whatever's floating in the water. And one of the things I wanted to point out that you can see, you see dead limbs. You'll see um, there's going to be vegetation along this creek. They, the wood ducks prefer habitat that has like a 50 to 75 percent cover. So you have open areas and then they love the cover. That's why it's kind of hard to film them. They'll be tucked in. Uh, there are fallen branches, leaves, they hide in there. And even though you think when you see a picture of the male, the most gorgeous duck you've ever seen, that they look so conspicuous, when they're in amongst those dead branches and leaves, you can hardly see them because they have, you know, lines that cut across their face. It just sort of makes it so that you, it's, almost, it's camouflage in a way, right? you cut an animal with lines, you can't see the, their body. And so they go in and they hide in those places. And that's the kind of habitat wood ducks really like. So the nuthatch is a cleaner too. He's walking around looking for insects, which we know there are lots of up there, even though you can't see them. Birds have incredible search image ability. Once they, once they learn what's out there, they just home in right on those tiny little things one after another. So these ducks are the, the hooded mergansers. 
and they look like females uh, and they do nest in the nest boxes and cavities just like the wood duck and that's one of the species that the wood duck will dump its eggs in uh, to get the merganser to raise them um, and so the thing with the wood duck eggs so they're a little bit thinner shell so when the merganser sits on them sometimes they they break uh, but the wood ducks still try to take advantage of these other mothers and that's a group of female mergansers and they're predators so you'll see them like dive rather than just dabble so they don't just like stick their butts up and go underneath like a ma mallard wood ducks do that right dabbling duck these guys can actually go under the water and they'll pick up big prey items like crayfish and uh, they have a very sharp beak grab it <laughs> we often see groups of females together too which is really fun uh, with the mergansers they're not closely related to the wood duck so there's a whole bunch of different types of ducks uh, and so the wood ducks are in one um, specific genus by themselves with another type of wood duck. What is it called? Mandarin. The mandarin duck. They're beautiful ducks. And then these are off on their own little side chain in the evolutionary tree. And you can see they have a different kind of beak and everything. Oh, it just did a display. I don't know if you saw that. That's why I'm wondering if some of them might be young males. They do this thing. So as I say, oh, s signaling in animals is often where they take motions that they normally do and mallards do the same thing where they'll stretch, they feed, they, they rear up, they stretch their wings like that, and they've co-opted those movements to become signals or displays where they're actually talking to each other. Um, and so they'll, <laughs> they'll rear up, go like that, and flap their wings and wiggle their tails, and those are actually signals. And so when courtship season comes along, that's going to be more and more and more. And so if you watch ducks, watch for those things, because they are talking to each other. Two male mallards and two females. Now, generally the mallards are going to pair off, male, female, male, female. Now you watch the male mallard. If he's doing things with his head, he might be communicating. And to have them so close together, there might... Now that female, yeah, you see that? <laughs> those little things are actually signals. So one female will see another male, she won't like that. She'll be moving her head and telling her male, her mate, you know, watch out, there's another male. If you ever see like three males by themselves and then a female with her mate, watch them because the female that has her mate is gonna be really antsy about the fact there are other males there and she will be signaling her mate to uh, challenge those other males. So watch for that because we think, you know, common bird, why bother to watch? They are really fascinating. Are they coming back? They're hanging out with the mergansers. The well, last thing about behavior, right? Just like fishing, you have to be patient. <laughs>are not deciduous, as you can tell. They're live oak. Sometimes we get valley oak, which does drop its leaves. And they're able to withstand really hot, dry weather. They have lots of wax on their leaves. And they're spread out where the adult trees can just dominate and gra grab all the water they can. And you end up with this uh, really diffuse set of trees competing with each other. And you can see why they need to get their acorns moved. Because you can't grow up at the feet of your mother. <laughs> A completely competitive tree. So that sort of open habitat is what um, the Native Americans would have lived with and what the Spanish discovered when they came here it was almost like park-like setting and it's natural that way. So then if we scan over you see the path here in the park and then the hillsides have classic California habitat as well, the chaparral which is scrub habitat. 
where it's very, very dry and the soil is very thin on those hillsides. So you get the scrub type habitat. Uh, so again, we're talking about life history strategies that you get these different types of plants and they don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily related, but they have the same sort of lifestyle that they can live up on the hillsides, the shrubs. And then you come over to the riparian habitat that we were just in where you have the trees with their feet in the water and they have these big, wonderful leaves that they can put out all summer and then drop them in the autumn. And I just think it's great. You just go for a short little walk and you can see all these different ways of making a living in a Mediterranean climate. And the last thing we want to talk about is this tree in front of us, which we call Charlie, Charlie Brown's Christmas tree because it looks like it has, you know, a few ornaments, kind of a sad Christmas tree. But those ornaments are the largest seeds in the non-tropical world. So in the tropics, you get much bigger seeds like coconuts and that sort of thing. But here you see what looks like a chestnut. This is a California buckeye. It's an endemic species to California, and it has a huge seed. And I just think it's the epitome of an extreme life history strategy for a, for a tree. So these are the seeds of the California buckeye. So you say either I have a really small hand or these are really big seeds. <laughs> but actually, these are really big seeds. Um, and you can see, like single branches will have like one seed with the outer casing on it, which splits open as it dries. And then the chestnut just drops. And as you know, they, it's a drop and roll strategy. So instead of being like the acorn, um, and then we'll also see cones as we walk along the pine cones, those are animal dispersed seeds. This is dispersed by gravity. Boom, uh, now here it's on flat land, so they're just right at the face of the mom. That might not be the best place to be, right? So what you see is, well, as it dries out, it splits and out comes the seed. This strategy for reproduction is kind of like what, what mammals do, is very, very high investment in each baby. Um, I think that's fantastic. So what's in this baby? All kinds of nutrients, and there's a lot of water. Now, how did this plant make that? In the... Uh, springtime this will be the first tree to put out its leaves and what's really surprising to me is it has buds already did you notice that it has buds already <laughs> what and it's December so um, it's gonna have these absolutely gorgeous huge leaves in the spring and it it goes it really taps into photosynthesis big time and so this tree the mother tree will, will just gain huge amounts of carbohydrates that it stores in its trunk and its roots, and then it will drop the leaves. Boom, it's one of those few things that we call drought avoidance. It drops the leaves in this Mediterranean climate. Remember I said it doesn't rain at all in the summer? It's extremely stressful, so you cannot support a large leaf, that large solar collector out here away from the creek. These buckeyes can grow up into the chaparral, um, where it's very, very hot and very, very dry, and they will drop the leaves and they'll be um, summer deciduous. Very unique plant. The other thing that makes them unique, as I said, is the high investment in, in the largest seed that you'll find in North America. And a seed is a baby. We have to remember that. That's the next generation. And the plant has stored all of the carbohydrates and has a really, really deep tap rope two things in its life history. It's drought avoidance and a taproot that goes way, way, way down. So let's say a fire came through and knocked out the top of this plant, it could just sprout right back, right? It's, it can go all the way down and find water where other plants can't. Um, so it relies on gravity. Now, one of the uh, scientists at Stanford, Hal Moody, did some fantastic work at Jasper Ridge on these plants, which is up in Palo Alto. Um, he found that any of the branches that produce seeds, it was such an investment that it it's actually strains the individual branches. That it's going to take them a lot longer to put out a new leaf next year. So, I mean, you can really see the toll that it takes on this, I call it the mother plant, um, to produce that seed. So it's just a fantastic example of life history diversity how a plant can live in the same place with live oaks and have a different strategy for how it manages uh, living in California.
Now, how if so if you have a drop and roll strategy for the seed, remember you see the seed rolling down the hill? Why would you ever find a buckeye at the top of a hill? <laughs> how did it get to the top of the hill? It turns out some animals actually do take these. Um, I forgot to mention, this plant is toxic all the way through. Leaves, flowers, which are gorgeous flowers, a lot of pollinators come to them. Uh, the, the branches, the seeds, every single part of this plant is toxic. It has glycosides, uh, they're neurotoxic, they will destroy red blood cells. Um, very, very poisonous plant, so you don't want to eat this unless you know how to manage it. But a few animals can, so some wood rats might take it, some squirrels might take it, some deer might take it, and the Native Americans also took them. But they, they only would take them if the acorn crop was poor. And when they did take it, they had to boil it and boil it and boil it, and then maybe make a powder out of it like they did with the acorns. But this has glycosides in it, um, really nasty compounds. And that's one thing that plants have to do is to protect themselves from herbivory and then some animals are able to handle it. So you get this competition and predation going on. Um, now the Native Americans also would make a powder out of this and throw it into the creek and uh, that glycoside would stun the fish temporarily and then they could gather the fish. You know, we take plants for granted, but look what it made. <laughs> Not only do they make wood, which we need to appreciate, look at this, these are chestnuts, and people think of chestnuts and Christmas at the same time, right? Uh, you don't want to eat these, but <laughs> they certainly are gorgeous. Here.